welcome to session two um, for the NYP Parents as Partners. And today you'll see again that I have the program model on the board because I want you to sort of see where we're going with these presentations. So last week we sort of began with an overall impression of the program with the philosophy and the subjects. Now we're going to start working from the inside out. So we talked about the Institute of Senate program. Today we're going to look at the IV Learner profile. Then we're going to be looking at global contexts and concepts. Then we're going to be looking at action service and a little bit about the personal project. And then I'm going to invite the heads of the subjects to come and speak to you specifically about their subject and what happens in their subject. Okay, so that's sort of the model of how we're going to work through, through the training so that you can see all the different components. And I promise today it won't be quite as long as last week. Um, so today we're looking at the learner profile. And you can see that this is our student. People say this is the PYP, the NYP and the diploma. It could also be the student, the parent, the teacher. Um, it doesn't sort of label who those, those silhouettes are for there, but whoever they are, before they can access anything else in the NYP, they must travel through the IB Learner Profile. So it's the thing that is the foundation of all that we do, it's the reason why, because we are trying to create students that fit the profile. That's our aim. The students to leave our programs with this, with these attributes. And I have a small video here from the IB, which runs through some of these things. minutes, but instead the students are in groups, 
they've been split. Each per each group has to investigate and inquire into a different tribe. They will then bring that back to the class and they will teach the class about each one of those individual tribes. And let me tell you, they enjoy that far better than me standing up the front talking to them. And they'll remember it and it will mean something to them. Because I don't really want them to be able to memorise what all the different barbaric tribes were and how they fought and what they ate. I want them to understand that there was this time in history when these people came down through Europe and took over from the Romans. I want them to understand that idea rather than a bunch of facts. So that's why they need to be inquirers. They don't really know. But for their life to be successful, they don't need to list off all the barbaric tribes. Okay? But for their life to be to understand the world they live in, it's also nice to go, ah, oh, France, the Franks, and then the Germanic tribes, Germany. Anglo-Saxons, England. You know, so they can start to make sense of the world that they live in and how it was formed. They're inquiring into that. And so along with that goes the fact that they're going to be knowledgeable. So that, that they will come away with a body of knowledge. And it's one thing that parents are concerned about. If this program is so wishy-washy and there's no textbooks, then how do I know my child is learning anything? What knowledge is my child learning? And so we do expect them to be knowledgeable and have, the, have knowledge about topics that they are covering in science and maths and methods. Okay? So hopefully at the end of the eight weeks on the Middle Ages, the students will have knowledge about what the Middle Ages look like how it affected how we live today. There will be knowledge and said, please don't go home and say, oh, they don't really learn anything, they just inquire and have fun and play games. Because that's that's not, not what it is. But we certainly do it in a different way that you and I did when we were at school, perhaps. I'm making assumptions here, you might have been in a very forward thinking place in your education, but usually we sat and we listened to the teacher and we sort of consumed knowledge that way. Stop it straight away with thinkers. So going in line in line with the whole idea of being inquirers, we expect them to think about the knowledge that is there. Inquire, they get the knowledge, and then they have to do some thinking about that. One of the lowest levels of thinking is, is remembering. So the road memorization that we did in high school to sit that test is actually a very low order of thinking. So we go to the higher orders of thinking. So students are asked to analyse, they're asked to synthesise, they're asked to evaluate. You might recognise that from Bloom's taxonomy of thinking. So our students are not left at that, the lowest level of thinking. They're expected to think at the higher levels of thinking. Um, and that's very, very important because that's what we all have to be to be successful. We have to be able to think at the highest level. We have to have a look at a problem. We have to be able to analyse what's going on with that problem. And then we have to be able to solve the problem, think outside the box. So our students are encouraged to think and to, to look at the problems from a different perspective, which is different, once again, from just a whole heap of facts. They need to be communicators. And this is where our language languages come in place. So the idea of having more than one language helps them to be better communicators. Um, the IB has a slant towards languages. They require a minimum of two languages in your child's experience, even to the diploma. So they are allowed to do six subjects in the diploma. They do six subjects in the diploma. Two of them are languages. So a third of their diploma studies are languages. So there is a strong focus because that's the reason we feel the way students can be more international is by being able to communicate with, with more people and have an understanding of different languages. So communicators are, are extremely important. That's where the languages come in. So even the, the tiny tots are doing Arabic and English. OK? 
again, they come up, they do two or three languages in the NYP. It's a requirement. We can't get away from that. That is absolutely necessary. Even so, in 9 and 10, they allow us to be a little bit more flexible with the curriculum and we're allowed maybe not to do art or we're not allowed, we don't have to do PE anymore, we don't have to do technology. We, we still do that, don't worry. But they never allow you to drop a language. Okay, the, the core subjects for them, the ones you can't drop, maths, English, science, humanities, English and the second language. There's no debate about that. So communication is extremely important in the eyes of of the RV. Okay, so reflective. We expect students in the NYP to complete an assessment task and then spend some time looking at that assessment task and finding out what went well, what didn't go so well, what am I going to do next time to make that better. So the reflection is a part of the teaching and learning cycle. It's not just an add-on, which is a nice little bit of frosting to the cake. It's actually an integral part of what they're doing. So your child, when they get back an assessment piece, they will be given time in class to go through how they did, to discuss what went right and what went wrong. It'll be part of the teaching that the, the, the teacher does with the students. So that's valuing this whole idea of being reflective. And so that's an important part. So they set goals, we have goal setting um, activities. You will be part of that when you go come to the, um, the portfolio days at the end of the year. You will see their work throughout the year and you will see how they have reflected on that work. When you attend the, the three-way conferences, um, which will be, be happening throughout the year, you will hear the students reflecting to you about how they're doing. So we actually don't have a parent-teacher interview at this school. We have three-way conferences. So that's the student, the parent, and the, the, the teacher reflecting on how it's all going for them. So that is in the calendar, I believe, and if it's not, I'll have to ask Miss Catherine if we can make sure you know about that. So I'll just do a bit of a sidestep here, a bit of information for you. By the middle of October, you will receive an interim report card for your child. So it's just a settling in report card. How have they said, just as good, satisfactory, unsatisfactory. It's not anything specific about their marking. If they have had an assessment task, you would have seen how they've gone on manage back. So you'll know how they're doing because you'll see straight away any levels of achievement they have received on manage back. So after the interim report cards, we have a full report card. Um, after the interim report cards, we have the three-way conference. So that's basically the week after the interim report cards. You're invited into school. We use the same booking schedule as they use for the PYP, with the booking buddy, and your, your students do not have school that day and they come in with you and they you have interviews with all their teachers. So you get a chance to speak to all their teachers and how they're going in each subject after the report cards. That's the first three-way conference. Then we have report cards at the end of January, beginning of February, full report cards, all subjects with comments on them. And then we have another interim report card in about April. That's changed because of the extended holiday now, but in about April. And at the, at the, the week after that interim report card, there's another three-way conference. So there's another opportunity for you to come up and speak to every one of your students, your child's teachers. And at the end of the year, in June, we have Portfolio Day, which sort of is a celebration of the work that your child has achieved throughout the year. Okay, so there is sort of interim report, three-way conference, full report, interim report, three-way conference, portfolio day. So there is quite a few times throughout the year that you're getting formalised feedback, but you're getting feedback continually by accessing ManageBack. So if there's something that comes up on ManageBack that alarms you, then immediately you can contact the teacher 
once you have your grade book and there's something on the grade book on Manage Back, the teacher's email comes up along the right hand side. At the moment that's not there because there's nothing in the no assignments being set. As soon as I've set the assignment for grade seven humanities, my email is there now. Okay, so that was a little bit confusing, Kathy. Um, so if there's any problems with any results, an email is the best way to start the correspondence. Because teachers will always check their email, they might not be free necessarily to give you a phone call straight away. So if you'd like to just have some clarification, or if you'd like to arrange a meeting, meet, contact the, 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 that teacher directly is the way to go. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, good. And it's self-explanatory, but this is where we're expecting students to um, take action, for example, for the good of the world, to be, when they're relating to each other in the classroom, to be principled in their discussions, to take into consideration other people's viewpoints, to be, you know, have the right way of, of thinking about different topics, or to respect other people's way of thinking about topic so we do we do talk about being principal and you know it's a difficult conversation with teenagers about is this principled with some of the things that happen in our world today and so it's just a matter of them asking them to be open-minded about listening to everyone's perspectives and so we have the United Nations in our classroom <laughs> so we have to make sure that we are very um, respectful and, and principal in our conversations about the Arab Spring, about the Syrian crisis, about these things that are occurring in our world because we have a Syrian student sitting there who could be hurt by any, any conversations. We, we, this part of the Ivy Learning Protocol is extremely important and our kids are pretty good at it. I must say very good at it. Perhaps better than us adults actually. <laughs> I, I hazard to say that. But Speaking for myself, I'll say that. <laughs> there we go, the yeah, open mind. Okay. So this is where um, this is where we see you in our classrooms. Because it's where we see the comments and you think that comment hasn't come out of a twelve year old's mouth. <laughs> that comment has come from home. So you know we, we, we know a lot about you actually before we even meet you. <laughs> Um, and it's not our fault because we didn't have the joy of this sort of education when, when we were growing up. But this whole idea of being open-minded, you know, to respect the views of other people, um, even if we don't agree with them necessarily, to be able to respect. Now, this is extremely important in this, the context of an international school, and we're lucky because the NYP is taught in many national systems, many national systems. I'll go to Greece in a couple of weeks and uh, the students there are all Greek, the teachers are all Greek and they, yeah, it's Greek. So for them to get different perspectives and be open-minded is more of a challenge. Our students, it just happens naturally. And so we're blessed in that, in my opinion, because we have the ability to be open-minded and, and things we didn't realise we were close-minded about, we'll realise, hey, that, that you know, is a, a learning experience for us. You know, as a, a Westerner coming into the region, I really, I'll be honest, didn't really understand the Palestinian situation at all because I'd only listened to the media in my country and so I didn't have any insight. So coming here, it's been wow, you know, and so I go home, back to home to Australia and I struggle with what I hear people saying and you probably have that same experience when you go home after living here. So our kids are living this experience. You know, and this is what's a fantastic about being here and having a program that allows for open-mindedness. There is no set content that I have to teach you from the American textbook which might say something we don't agree with about a certain situation. I won't keep picking on, well, it's hard for me to pick on political situations because we never talk about politics or religion in an open forum, but you know what I mean? So if I take the American viewpoint from that American textbook, how am I being open-minded? Because that's not right. If I want to speak about the Palestinian crisis, I invite my Palestinian student up here, or my Palestinian teacher, 
come and share with us your experience. My grandma's listening. Get her to come in. Get her to talk to us about what happened. Yeah, that's we, that's what we need to we need to do because yeah, we need to teach our students. Our kids have grown up in the international world, and when they get home to my mum's place, who's 75, they speak Portuguese to each other, the three of them, which is very rude. But they all grew up. They grew up for six years in Portugal, and my mum says, "Now listen." The rule is around the table you not to speak Portuguese because you're excluding people and it's rude. I agree. So they're not allowed to speak Portuguese to each other. And so my, my daughter Brooke was, you know, has just gone home, just left here, graduated and said around the table, I just find Australians so parochial. And her cousin said, Brooke, you're not allowed to speak Portuguese. <laughs> idea of what parochial is that so for her this is her biggest struggle going back to Australia which I love and adore and very proud to be Australian is her biggest struggle and this is a struggle your guys will have as well coming here being open-minded and then leaving and, and still being open-minded and coming against grandparents perhaps that, that struggle with this you know um, so it's it's really they don't understand the impact that this education has had on them until they perhaps leave the bubble that is Raha and leave the bubble that is Abu Dhabi and get back. So I can see you all nodding your head that this is something that is happening or could happen if you're newly out of the country. This is something that they will, will sort of um, come across. Yeah, and they'll need to be open-minded. And we all need to be open-minded about, about all this. So this, the IB encourages that attribute in our students. It's valued and encouraged. Now that's not such an IB thing, being caring. You expect that, right? As parents, we ask our kids to be caring. But it's, it's ingrained into the program. So action as service, or as we used to call community and service, is something that is expected. So you, you will be caring because you, know, you have to fill in some objectives to show how caring you've been. So um, it is something that we do expect. Some of our students have trouble with this. They don't particularly like doing things for other people. It's not part of their psyche or part of their, their experience. So they really, it seems funny for us, but they do struggle to, to reach out to others. It's not part of something that they're used to. So it's up to us as a school to support that and give them structures to, to assist in that. We'll be talking a little bit more about action in another in another um, session. Um, but you know, I encourage you, if you have any ideas for your students, you are my um, feelers out in the community, really. So you might have heard of ideas, like um, one mum came to me, and she's not here today, and said, you know, I've heard of these babies in, in the jails here, that their mums have had them in jail, and, these babies have no toys. Can I get my sons to help collect toys and take them? I said, oh, that's an awesome idea, but I had never heard of it. So you are in touch with the community. So if you ever hear of things that we can be doing to help our students be caring and do this action service, then we appreciate it. And I'm actually going to be formulating an action team with the students, and I'm going to be asking parents to volunteer to be put on that team because I think you you have a better idea than even myself. But most of my life is spent here at this place. So you being part of the community perhaps have a better idea of what opportunities our students can have um, helping out in the community. Risk takers. So teenagers love this one because any time they're doing something dangerous, they're like, just being a risk taker, miss. <laughs> Uh, that's not what that's about. <laughs> it's about um, just stepping outside your comfort zone. So I'm going to ask Rashid on Sunday to stand up and talk for the first time in front of a group of people about his barbaric tribe. And he is really scared because <laughs> he's never had to do that in his previous school. He's frightened the kids are going to laugh at him. He's, he doesn't sort of, and you know, so it really is stepping outside his comfort zone. So I have to do a lot of work with him to encourage him and build up a classroom climate where he knows he won't be laughed at. But our students just simply doing that, even though it doesn't sound much to us, 
that's a lot for a teenager to stand in front of 25 other teenagers and put themselves out there. So that's the sort of risk taking that we ask them to do. For me, the risk taking would be what they're doing in PE at the moment, which is the beep test. <laughs> yeah, have you heard of the beep test? You all heard of the beep test? That would be being a risk taker to me, you know, to have to run in front of everyone as fast as you can and sort of get the lowest score, you know. <laughs> so that would be me being a risk taker. So I sort of try and share that with. Kids, we all have situations where we're not comfortable and we just have to, whether we like it or not, step outside our comfort zone. So we like to do that with our students in a, in a supportive environment. Now, if, you, if your child is really finding all this way, way too much and it's affecting their, their, their equilibrium, then please let us know. Like, we need to know that sort of stuff. And, and, and thankfully, we're very lucky at Raha to have a number of counsellors. We have a careers counsellor full time, and we have a guided, um, a guided, an um, emotional counsellor. I suppose you would call them full time. So they're two wonderful um, colleagues of mine who are there to support the students through all of this. And believe it or not, some of our students do struggle with getting acclimatised to the program. Yeah. So we have that support for them. Um, I'm not liking the way I'm doing this with this video, but anyway, we've started now, so I have to keep going. Um, balance is where we encourage the students to not, not, it's not just about academic work. So they have to do an arts, they have to do PE, they have to do design, okay, and maths and English. So it's talking about being balanced, about this is where our school has to be open minded because many, some of our parents expect their students to go home and do extra lessons, other schools, and so they're working for four or five hours after school. So sometimes this can create a little bit of unbalance between home and school when we're encouraging them to be balanced. When I tell them on their plan to write in half an hour for video games, it's like, <gasps> but as long as it's half an hour as a relaxation before or after homework, that's being balanced. Correct? It's only when the video games are five hours or six hours long that's unbalanced. Okay, so we're encouraging them to reflect, to think about what, what is balanced and to make sure that they're living a balanced lifestyle. That's that's taught to them. That sort of is discussed. Yeah. side and a list of people at the top, students is one sheet, teachers is another sheet, administrators is another sheet, parents is another sheet. And what I want you to do is to work in small groups and to try and fill in what you would see a balanced teacher doing. What would it look like? What is a principal teacher doing? What, what is, a, is a, a communicator, a, a teacher who is a communicator, what does that look like in our school? What does a, an open-minded parent look like? What are some of the things that you would see an open-minded parent doing? So what I want to try and find from you is your impression, what you think 
this IB learner profile looks like in action. What are some of the things you'll physically see in a school community from all these people? The cleaners are written on a sheet of paper. What sorts of things will you see the cleaner doing to match these IB learner profile attributes? What will you see a teacher doing to match these IB learner profile attributes, etc.? Okay, so I'm going to give you 10 minutes to do that and then we'll wrap up this session. Okay, so it's out here on the tables.